Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Realm. I'm Travis Bruce and today I have a special guest with us. He is the publisher and creator of Voodoo Maverick Publishing and has an amazing comic series that's called Matilda. I have with us Ted Wally. Ted, welcome to the Horror Realm. Thanks for having me on here, Trav. It's a pleasure, brother. It's a pleasure. So tell us a little bit about Matilda. I've seen a little bit of the images and I'm so curious. Uh, Matilda is about uh, the firstborn child, kind of a human hybrid, demon hybrid, of uh, Lucifer, who is um, uh, geared to being, to, she leads all of Hell's armies and all this kind of good stuff, and she's been basically trained her whole life to um, uh, defeat the forces of uh, good and heaven in one final battle and uh but she decides that she realizes what her dad's real plans are she defects to the other side and so uh, now she is fighting on the side of good and so she's having to fight all these demons from hell to, they're trying to collect the bounty on her head bring her back to hell and uh she is also fighting angels that don't trust her, and she has to also learn the, the why why God favors humans over all of his other creations, what it means to be a human being, and she has to pass the third grade as well. I love it, man. I love it. This is this is this is a this is a wild fucking story, man. So, what gave you the inspiration? Um. Well, actually, uh, some buddies of mine uh, were putting together a comic book at the time, and uh, they had asked me, uh, the guy who was writing, creating the book, asked me to uh, take a look at his book and his business plan, because I worked with advertising and design, uh, I worked for an ad agency and things like that, and uh, so he wanted me to take a look at his printing setups and his budgets and all that thing, and... Uh, he was doing a sword and sorcery comic and he was doing the sword and sorcery comic. And this was way before like Lord of the Rings uh, and Harry Potter and stuff like that. The only sword and sorcery comics at the time were uh, Conan comics and they were just basically reprinting older Conan comics that they had run at the time. And so it wasn't really popular. It wasn't going to do a whole lot of money. And when I basically broke all this down for him, um, it wasn't the news that he wanted to hear. And, very kind of, I don't know, backhandedly, he looked at me and he said, well, if you think you know so much or could do better, then why don't you do your own comic? So I did. <laughs> and, and I'm still publishing my comic, and I'm one of the longest-running self-publishers in New Orleans of graphic novel series, and he doesn't. He, his stuff folded after about the third issue. So uh, that was the real inspiration of me doing the book was you know it's you know i'm what the kids call today salty so if you're gonna test me then then i'm gonna roll up my sleeves and i'm gonna i'm gonna show you what i know how to do and uh when i was trying to decide you know i had i you know wrote down a list of uh you know ideas that i could do and i narrowed it down to three and uh, based off of my own knowledge of how, you know, what I learned when I was helping my friend out with his paperwork and things like that, uh, superheroes were one. And, you know, I want to be eliminating that because that's really a hard one, a genre to you know, kind of break out in, even to this day. And so I landed on the Matilda idea. It was one of the three. And I chose that one because it was different. You know, I know how to draw superheroes and muscular superheroes and stuff like that. And, uh, I want something that was different, different kind of story, different kind of look. And uh, and so, yeah, that's what really kind of led me to doing Matilda. Fucking love it, man. By the way, man, I am a salty son of a bitch, too, man. I mean, the, the, the reason I had this, the reason I started doing interviews on my YouTube channel, because someone, when I first started, someone had me on their show. They were like, I know way more about interviews than you and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, bet, motherfucker. And I got more subscribers than they do now, so. <laughs> you know, and when I did this, uh, when I started doing the book and things like that, I didn't tell anybody tell any of my friends you know my family nothing nobody knew until that first book hit in the local comic book shops and then when it hit you know i actually within a day i had a couple of people 
were like, oh my God, I saw this book and I opened it up and there's your photo right there. I didn't know you were doing a book. I was like, so I didn't want to tell anybody. And I didn't want to tell anybody because it was mine. And mm -hmm. whether it succeeded or failed, it was, it was all on me. And I just did it because I wanted to do it. And, um, you know, anything that comes after that, you know, followers, it, people that spend money on it or whatever, you know, that's, that's all the, that's the mozzarella stick in the chicken basket. You know, it's that bonus exactly. that that's not why I did it, but Hey, that's great. I'm glad you guys want to, you know, you know, talk to me about it or, you know, pay for it or whatever, but that's not why I really do it. So that's just all lane app. So yeah, it's, you know, you, test me on something and, and it's, it all dates back to of all things when I was like six <laughs> and played Monopoly for the first time and lost horribly. And as a child sitting there at the kitchen table, you know, crying because I lost, you know, my mom and dad are looking at me. They're like, well, it's, you know, your first time playing the game. You just didn't know the rules, but when you learn the rules then you can play the game better. And that's stuck with me into adulthood is that, you know, there's nothing I can't learn. And once I, all I need to do is know how to know the rules and I can play the game just as good as you. Love it, brother. Now, now what is, so I'm a huge, so I'm an 80s kid and I grew up on comics. I'm a huge comic fan. I still have my comic books and plastic. I'm like a huge collector as well. And right now, unless you go to an actual specialty comic book shop, I used to remember I could go to a grocery store or even a, a pharmacy store and they would have comic books on the stand. Yep. What is what are some challenges right now of being a comic book maker? Uh, I have when when people ask me this or it comes up like in a discussion, um, it's also actually in a, a how to book that I'm about finished writing. It's uh, I have this picture. Uh, and it's a, a meme that I create, and that's why I usually share with people. But it's a picture from one of the largest recorded concert crowds. I think it was in South America, but it was a Metallica concert. And it's from the view of their stage, so it's like you're just seeing this sea of people. And it's, you know, here are all the comic book creators out there in the world, and this little one right here, that's you. You know, it's just that the field is because everyone can do it, um, with the advent of the internet and things like that, anyone can do one. And, uh, it's just an incredibly, it's like this crowd, you know, trying to get eyes on your, on your book. And, um, and, and that's, that's, that's to me is the biggest challenge. You know, it's, it always drives me nuts when they'll ask a question of like, you know, what, you know, what social media platforms are the best for this? It's like, if there were a formula champ, we'd all be using it. You know, what what are the best conventions I should go to to, uh, to promote my comic? Again, if there was a formula, we'd all be using it, kiddo. So the hardest thing is, I think it's because it's so saturated. Um, and interestingly enough, saturated with really quality content. There's a lot of really, really is. books out there. And uh, it's just being able to get eyes on your book and finding that audience that you know uh would look at it and say oh wow this is actually really kind of cool i've never seen this kind of thing before so that to me i think is going to always be the challenge is getting that book out there getting eyes on it and um and that there's no 100 percent tried and true way to do it it's all going to be based off of the content of your book, based off what your audience is and, you know, in a lot of trial and error. So uh, that would be my thing is, you know, I mean, uh, I've had discussions where it's, you know, about distribution and putting into shops and things like that. And that, to me, that's like a small, you know, infinitesimal of it. You know, the internet is much larger than shops and I love shops, but uh, I understand business too. And so it's, it's, it's a lot harder for a shop to take a chance on something that you know they're not sure they're going to get their money back on where it's a lot easier for me to put it up on webtoons for free it's true yeah. and I, I, I mean for for me like a lot of the new comics that i have discovered over the years i go to a lot of horror conventions and you know that's one way that i have you know become fans of some new comic series that no a lot of people don't know about but as well have this channel too because you know i've ran across some amazing fucking indie horror comics or just comics in general and like i tried to get them on this platform because yeah there's some really good shit out there right now 
yeah. And that's that is so as far as like indies go, um, and when I'm at like shows and stuff like that on panels, that question comes up a lot, and it's usually from you know someone else that's looking to do their thing and. You know, usually what I advise people is like, that's going to be your biggest challenge is it's, you know, being able to get your eyes on it and juggling that whole thing of um, uh, one of my buddies. Um, he uh, and he's actually worked for like, you know, some of the major companies as well. And he does his own indie thing now. But he and I were talking shop one day and he was just like, man, he's like, another thing that you got to juggle is that whole thing of I got to create content. And so I can't spend a whole lot of time uploading to all these different sites and things like that, you know, because mm -hmm. the more time I'm spending not creating content is the less content that I actually have to upload to all of these sites. So you got to be able to kind of streamline it and uh, keep your finger on the pulse. And if it's not working and your audience isn't there, then, you know, that's when you go and explore and find something else. And he also was fond of saying that, you know, by the time we as creators, uh, land on, you know, hey, everyone's, you know, looking at this site and the kids have already moved on to the next cool thing. And that's not an ageism statement. It's just the way technology works and that attention span. And it's that, you know, by the time everyone lands on, you know, you know, this, you know, the kids are already looking at something else already. And so, uh, so yeah, you just got to kind of strike that balance of I got to create content and, uh, one of the things I usually equate it to is it's like investment portfolios when you're investing in your retirement, your 401ks and stuff like that, where you're working for something and you have a retirement account um, and they're investing in the stock markets is that they'll all, you know, it all is tied into that is that they go to this kind of tried and true, you know, it's like just hold the course and, and just be consistent and hold the course that you know you may not be getting necessarily a lot of returns on this one site but if you're consistent with your content and you're posting regularly and things like that then it starts it starts to come so uh so yeah it's uh it's you know and also find out where your audience hangs out at you know you got to look at yeah you know what it is that you put out so like for example you know you you put out you know this podcast uh this podcast this youtube channel and it's all a lot of it's really horror related well you know mm -hmm. you're going to horror conventions you know you're not going to go to yep. san diego comic-con because you know it's not that there are no horror fans there it's just that that's not what that audience is walking in for they're walking in to see the latest marvel thing drop or the latest dc thing drop and stuff like that you know they're not yeah. looking for that kind of stuff so understanding you know and being really just kind of you know, taking emotion out of the equation. I tell people, it's like, you know, you got to be like Leon in the professional, you know, it's like, yes, no, no, no women, no kids. It's pro. That's all it is. Give me what it's I got to do. And then and that's what I got to do. And being really honest with yourself. And so you say, you know, I'm not going to go to this show because they're not, they're looking, you know, for a little indie guy, you know, they're looking to get an autograph from Sting. You know, he's one of the guests there or whatever. So it's just being smart about what you're doing and uh, then finding that balance between content creation and getting the word out there. I agree. And like, e even like with my channel, when it comes to marketing, yeah, I got a Friday 13 shirt on, but <laughs> the, the, the people who watch my channel are not the majority of horror fans. And I consider them the casuals, you know, for like, for like majority of horror fans are the casuals mm -hmm. and they aren't the ones who like Friday the 13th and Michael Myers. I focus on mostly indie horror creators. So like when it comes to, so I target fans who are, who are mostly, uh, I would say who are fans of indie horror, which is a smaller niche than if I made a channel about mainstream horror. Right. Right. Yeah, it's uh, and then it's again, it's you know, you as a content creator, just like any of us indie guys, we're content creators. Is it's that knowing what it is that I'm doing? It's that I usually like when I teach the comic book class uh, out of the college I work at. Is you know, everyone wants me to jump to the end, and they're like, just tell me how to get this thing out. And it's just like, man, you gotta, you know, we gotta walk back to like, you know, what your mission statement is. You know, what it is that you're trying to do so that if you understand your content, then that's what helps you understand who your audience is. Once you, and then once you understand what your content is, what your audience is, then you can start finding where you fit in that big crowd, you know? And so, yeah, having that clear idea of this is what it is, this is what I do, 
tells me what my audience is that I'm looking for, that I'm not going to then waste a lot of energy and time trying to get people into something that this isn't what they're looking for. You know, it's, that's, you know, I, like Blade said, it's some motherfucker trying to ice skate uphill. You know, it's, yep. <laughs> why am I going to do that? And so, uh, so yeah, that's, it's, you know, usually the first step that I recommend with, you know, anyone that's like trying to get into it, whatever it is that you're trying to get into is, you know, figure out what it is that you're going to do. And that's what you're going to do. And then once you know what that is, then you can start looking at where do I fit? You know, where do I fit in? And if I know my, if I know what I'm doing, then I know what my audience is looking for. And, uh, uh, yeah, like I always will tell, you know, you know, comics guys and stuff like that when they ask us, like, you gotta have a comparison, you know, that's what everyone wants. And it's, and it's not, I mean, of course there's nothing new under the sun, but it's like, you know, it's part of how you're selling it to those new people is that you can compare it to something. So, like, in your case, you could instantly say a couple of popular indie horror movies. You could say, hey, you know, have you ever seen uh, Blair Witch Project? And we're like, well, sh- yeah, I've seen Blair Witch Projects. Well, then you need to look at my channel because Blair Witch Project was an indie horror film that was made for about, like, 30K. And, uh, you know, and it's, again, it's you understanding what you do that you can then make these associations and grab that audience or someone walks by and says, Oh yeah, that's, that's not really my bag. I was, I watched Blair Witch and made me nauseous with the cameras going around and all that kind of exactly. stuff. Okay, <laughs> no problem. You're not my, you're not, you're not the fish that I'm fishing for, but your partner is standing right there next to you. He's walking over to my table. So now I've hooked one in. So yeah, it's, it's, you get, you get it just like a lot of us do is just and some don't, but that's what my advice is. Yeah. And I have a sales and marketing background. So like I know, you know, yeah. targeting who you're tar- finding, who your target audience is, and you hone in on that target audience as much as possible. Yeah, I got an advertising now, and marketing background. That's what I used to do to pay the bills for the longest. So it's it's helped out a lot here too. Now now speaking about technology, AI is mm-hmm. a thing. You know, it's it's definitely, you know, when it comes to indie authors, like a lot of authors are using AI and publishers are not accepting AI. Do you think AI is going to have a negative effect on indie horror? I mean, any horror comic creators or comic creators in general? Um, my thoughts on AI in terms of how that goes is that we're not going to get the genie back in the bottle. And what's going to wind up happening with AI is it's going to, minute it starts costing someone money, then it's going to wind up being regulated. I look at back in the 90s. I want to say it was back in the 90s um, when uh, hip-hop was becoming really mainstream. And um, two people, uh, Biz Markie and George Clinton, sued record companies because people were using samples from their stuff Mm -hmm. in their albums and they weren't getting money for it. And they won. And because it was true is that, you know, they created the content that you may be putting only a couple of seconds in there. But the reality is, is someone else did that. And it's not going to be if it's going to be when um, someone creates something that in a legal sense confuses an audience. And that's, you know, what a copyright infringement is, is it's that if you confuse an audience and I've sat on, you know, in on this kind of stuff as far as courts goes that I work for a company that we did a design for their uh, product and we advised them. We're like, Hey, it's going to, it looks too much like these guys, your competitors. And they didn't care. Well, they were taken to court, they were sued and they lost because the minute you confuse an audience thinking, Oh, this is this. And they look at it as like, Oh, it wasn't what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. It's cost somebody money. And so my thoughts are, is it's going to eventually be regulated because someone's going to, wind up creating something that confuses the audience into thinking that, oh, this was an Alec Ross painting. And Alec Ross is going to look at it and say, I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, you're making money off of it, and it looks just like I did it, and it's not an influence at that point. It is you're confusing the public. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't – and I think once it gets regulated, then it's going to wind up becoming – it's going to find its niche, just like, you know, digital sampling and that uh, it's gonna, you can't put the genie in the bottle back. And I've always told everyone, it's like you can love AI, you can hate AI, but you better understand how it works. 
because it's not going anywhere. And I've actually used AI by putting in my own work and uh, then asking it to render it back in my style. It's like, you know, I need to design this kind of demon and make it look like Ted Wally's style, blah, blah, blah. And it comes up with stuff that I'm like, wow, I would never have thought of that. And I'm the guy. So, uh, so I use it as, you know, creating my own references and uh, in my style. And it gives me enough that I can jump off from. And uh, then I don't have to do a photo shoot because, you know, I can just kind of describe what it is I want it to look like in my style. So understand it. Don't be afraid of it. You can still hate it, but it's not going to go away, you know, and uh, whether and then the whole thing of whether it's going to create good stuff or bad stuff, you know, good and bad is is subjective. You know, it's, uh-huh. uh, you know, it reminds me of Hamlet where it's, you know, where he says that, you know, it's neither good nor bad. Uh, but thinking it is, is what makes it be. And so, you know, I can put 10 people in front of Picasso and get 10 different opinions of whether it's art or not. And uh, so good or bad is just going to come to, you know, what, what people think when they look at it. And so if it's, you know, as far as comics go, horror movies go, stuff like that, give me a good story, man. You know, and I can, I can look past so much of bad effects or even... You know, not quality acting, you know, but hey, man, that was a really good story. And I like that story. Give me that. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. I think it's just going to be not going anywhere anytime soon. I agree. Now, so, so many, by the way, you brought, you brought up an interesting point. I've said this many times. So many, I feel like, creators don't realize that, like, special effects and the acting and all this stuff. Yeah, that's, that can be important, but a good story and character development is, I mean, as somebody who's an audience, is more important than anything. Like, if, if you ask me right now, Travis, what is your favorite movie? doesn't have the greatest acting, doesn't, is cheaply made, it's Bloodsport with John Claude Van Damme. <laughs> My favorite fucking movie. And right. it's because it has a great fucking story. Yeah. The acting's horrible in that movie. <laughs> And it's a dumb concept, but it's a great fucking story. Yeah, and that's like, you know, I watch, a, I purposely will dig through, you know, deep into Amazon and stuff like that and find these really bad movies because I, I like watching these bad movies for their potential that I could look at it and say, man, you know, if they had this amount of budget to it because that story was so good, but they just couldn't tell the story the way the story deserved to be told. And, you know, and I find a lot of gems like that, you know, that it's like I sit there and say, man, that was, you know, you know, by special effects standards, by acting standards was really kind of, you know, bad. But, man, that story was a really cool concept. That was a really good story. So I can I can forgive a lot. And, and it, to me, it comes back to even, you know, my comic book days that it's like, um, you know, I could forgive a bad art team because the story was really good. You know, mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, and there, you know, were some, you know, and there were some art teams that, like, you know, I could see an artist and then an inker on top of them, and I'm just like, man, that inker's got a really heavy hand. That he's really obscuring the really good pencils that are laid down on there, and, you know. But hey, that story was really good. That I kept turning the pages. That I could forget a lot of the bad artwork because that story was so engaging. So, yeah, that's so important. Now, I'm assuming that you're, you've always been a horror fan as well. To... Yes, actually, I remember being a small child <laughs> watching the Dark Shadows TV show, the original British nice. Dark Shadows TV show, and hiding behind the couch every time Barnabas <laughs> Collins showed his fangs. And, uh, and so, yeah, as, a, as an adult, I just kind of started gearing towards uh, to horror. And um, then as an adult, uh, even uh, as an older adult, I started gearing myself more towards horror that I really kind of focused a lot on the story. And if it breaks a trope and gives me an ending that I was not expecting, um, then yeah, it, sign me up. You know, it's, I like these, I like these stories that they, they like break tropes and, uh, and gimmicks, you know, and things that like, you know, like Halloween when, you know, when, when he starts rising back up, nobody did that before. And now yeah. everybody does it. And so it's like when they do a shot and it's the movie and the villain stays down and he doesn't get back up, I'm just like, yes, that's yes, I know. 
that's weird. Like, now. I, we'll take that. Like I saw an indie horror movie recently, and um, God, I wish I could think of the name. I, I watched so so many for for my show, but like it was the asshole guy was the survivor. Right. And, like, I was like, fuck. I mean, but it made sense that he would be a survivor. He was the biggest. He was the strongest. Mm-hmm. And like so, so, for him to be the survivor, I was like, "Well, that makes fucking sense." But like, I'm like, and I just gave it an extra plus because of that, you know? Right? Yeah. It's um, like some people, uh, I'll they'll ask me uh, when I'm doing um shows and stuff like that. They're like, you know, your your main character is a girl. Why did you Why did you come up with a girl? And I tell them, it's like. When I was a teenager, early teenager, uh, one of the first uh, horror movies that I got to see on my own uh, was the first Alien. And, you know, it's like, so, you know, you're I'm watching the whole thing through, you know, and here's Sigourney Weaver. And it's like, I'm like, I was just like stunned because that was something that, again, was breaking these tropes. It's like, you know, I'm growing up from an age... You know, where John Wayne, you know, was, 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 you know, and it was always the John Wayne and Charles Bronson and, and stuff like that. But here's a woman and she's badass. I'm talking about the first one. The second, when the second one came out, you know, then it really blew the lid off of, and if anything, it told me I was right about making a girl, you know, that a girl could be badass and a girl can, uh, especially if you push the, the female character to be the badass of it, just like any guy could be at. It's like, you know, that, that that's, it's different, you know, and, and it can be just as engaging and still be different and challenge those views. And so when I saw it on screen, I was just like, yeah, that, wow, that's, you know, so when they said like, you know, why'd you make it a, a female? That's why it's because a female could be badass. And, you know, and I made it a little girl and uh, because it's funny seeing these little girls, you know, this little cartoony looking girl using swear words like an adult would. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I've got the female lead and she uses all these guns and she uses swear words. It's like, what, what could possibly be wrong with all that? Yeah, you can't miss it. And I mean, because I mean, you can always go the safe route, which is, and hard in, in general, you can always go the safe route. Right. I just love a horror creator that can go out the box to the point where they are like almost like people might not even fucking like this. People might hate this because it's not the norm. But that makes me like it even more. Right. You know, it's just it's like because it's different. It's like I was watching this one movie uh, on Amazon. I think it was called uh, Howl. And um, it was this totally different take on werewolves. And it was, you know, and it followed, a, you know, a, a kind of a standard formula. It, you know, they're on a train. But the werewolves, the werewolves were different. You know, they weren't like, they didn't look like dogs. And it was like, wow, so this looks like what, if I were reading, like, legends about, you know, werewolves and stuff like that, you know, that they had these kind of sort of, you know, canine faces, but they had long stringy hair like humans and they looked more human hybrid than animal hybrid. And it was different. I was just like, this is great. This is a different take on it. I can totally get, I can totally dig this movie because it was really good acting, really good story. They knew, you know, how to make this horror film, but then they, you know, like, you know, when Carpenter's the thing came out, it was like, it was so flipping different. That you're just like, wow, man, this is good. I like this. That when you step away from it, as to to make us sound fancy, like we're connoisseurs, that we, we can look at it and we can say, you know, the movie didn't really break that much ground. It followed a formula, but it did a couple of cool things that were totally different that we could say, man, I'm sold on this movie. You know, because it didn't break any real, tr- you know, tropes, but it did this one thing or this one cool thing. Like we're saying, the asshole was the one that survives in the end. It's yep. different, you know? So I can forgive yep. a lot and say, I actually enjoy this movie because it threw something at me that was more of a surprise than a jump scare. It was something in the story that not everyone does. It's like, you know, when you see a movie, at least for me, when I see a movie and a romantic interest doesn't develop between two two major characters. I'm just like that's great because nobody does yep. that. It's like exactly. you know, <laughs> you know, all movies. You know, it's somewhat you know, believable. 
Yeah, yeah it's and it's like, relatable. Yeah, and so it's like, you know, then I can kind of relate to it that, you know, any of your messed up things that you can do or you can follow it all according to formula, but you did that one thing that is just challenges me that I wasn't expecting. And I, I usually will tell my students or stuff like that as like usual suspects. That's, you know, one that I can point to that it's like when you get to the end, that wasn't what you were expecting. You know, it, you know, seven is another one that's like at the, you know, when, when I went to go see seven, the girl I was dating at the time, I was just like, man, you know, it's going to be this, you know, freaking Brad shirt's going to have to take his shirt off and Brad in and he's going to rescue the girl and stuff like that. And it turned out to be nothing like that. And so I was sitting there saying, it's like, man, that's what I like. I wasn't expecting any of those things. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can just be the subtle thing that you break from form of the formula that you know it's you know it's like cooking in the kitchen man i can make candy bacon any kind of way you want you know but i may change just one ingredient this one time and it's just like it's a whole different experience that you weren't expecting and it doesn't have to be a big thing that's all you do you just add your own little spice on man and that's what's key yeah and then i always you know tell people as creators it's just like man you know just you know do it do it for you i mean we hear the whole thing of right write the movies that you want to watch, write the comics, create the comics that you want to read. And that is so true in, in, in at least in what I do that. And it's also comes back to the things that I wind up actually enjoying more than anything else. It's that, you know, do that thing that you like to do it and throw that extra thing in that you want to do because it's you and it's the movie that you want to see that, um, you know, people, if people like it, you know, that's, yeah, that's, I, I hate to say it, that's, that's the thing that keeps you humble. That's like, man, I'm so glad you guys liked it. You know, I didn't do it for you, but, you know, I'm so, I'm so glad that you guys liked it and, I'm, and spent money on it and all this kind of good stuff. But, man, I just, I just did the thing that, you know, it was something that I wanted to do. Exactly. All right. Ted, you've seen my show before, so you, you, you know what I'm about to do. I'm about to ask you three random horror questions. Right. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, let's do it, baby. Okay, the first one. Who is the most annoying character? That you, so I did the top five most annoying characters in horror movies. Off the top of your head, who is who would you say the most annoying character you see in a horror movie? Like by name or by the 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 uh, genre in terms of like the hero or the villain or whatever. Um. um just it could be any it could be the final girl it could be just a random character who gets fucking killed and you're like god i'm fucking glad i got <laughs> i think for me the most annoying character um class because i'm a role D D guy and stuff like that so i guess uh class i think i would have to say the most annoying kind of character would be probably the girl that's the screaming girl you know it's the one that just kind of does the, the you know, and I know it goes against type, you know, because the Scream Queen is, you know, <laughs> is one of the pivotal points of, of, of all of all this horror. But for me, it always irritated me. The Scream Queen always irritated me, you know, and maybe comes, you know, from, you know, how, you know, where, how I was raised and how I was born. But it's like, man, you know, it's like, you know, I need a girl that if, you know, if the shit hit, shit goes sideways, she's in there swinging with me. And she's not yeah. standing there screaming, saying, get off him, get off him. She's in there swinging with me. So, and, you know, and I guess it kind of goes back to, like, I was making those comparisons earlier to the badass female and stuff like that. So, yeah, the one that's just standing there screaming, you know, has always annoyed me because you're not bringing anything other than your, your probably your tits and your scream. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. I 100% agree with you. And, and also with that, with that scream queen, is the hottie in the closet from the killer and she's breathing <laughs> i'm sorry i'm pushing that bitch out of the closet <laughs> if, if she's making all that fucking noise like yeah, exactly all that fucking noise exactly yeah I, I agree with that is that you know it's um i i mean i don't know i mean i've sat enough uh with enough directors and producers and and stuff like that in my lifetime and just kind of talk and shop and listen to stuff that they were saying is that and a lot of that is in there because it's somebody that they grew up with that kind of stuff and they really believe <laughs> that's what people expect that's what people want and so we're putting it in there because it's always been in there before 
And that's why when, again, as connoisseurs, we can look at some of these, you know, what I like calling, you know, digging in the crates that you really find these kind of things in there. And one of the reasons that we like is because it does break those kind of tropes and it doesn't give us all the formula um, and that's what makes them so enjoyable. And so, you know, there's something to be said about something I can predict all the way through. And yeah, that girl screaming and then sniffling in the closet, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to expect, you know, the knife coming through right in front of her face. You know, <laughs> there's something there's something to be said for predictability. I, you know, I, we all have predictability in my, you know, I expect when I get up in the morning that I'm going to have breakfast and I'm going to go to work and all that kind of stuff. There's something to be said for routine and predictability. But... You know, yeah. that we really kind of enjoy and the things that stay with us. Those are the ones that, uh, you know, challenge us with something different. I agree. And the second question. All right. What horror villain would you say that you relate to the most? Not that you're killing people, but you say, you know, I understand where they're coming from. Um, I think the horror villains that I relate to most are... Um, and I know Marvel gets a lot of grief about it, but um, it's the it's the villain that like they have a point of view that you can actually kind of understand and that you can relate to in some sort of way. You don't necessarily condone the way they're getting from point A to point B. So it's like, you know, the Joker is a good example in terms of like the killing joke. You know, he was trying to explain that everyone is just one really bad day away from going insane. And I can understand that, you know, there's, you know, it happens to a lot of people, road rage incidents, all that kind of stuff. Everyone's one bad day from you just don't know what they're going to do. And I remember being taught that a lot in security work uh, about de-escalating situations because you don't know what day that person's had. And all I'm trying to do is get you to not touch the dancers or whatever. But um, so I can relate to a lot of that because it is kind of believable. And that everyone's going to, is that one day, bad day away from things. I don't condone, just like Batman told the Joker, he's like, yeah, but you don't have to kill anyone for it. Just guys shouldn't get it. You're making a choice there. So, yeah, I think a lot of the villains uh, from horror movies that I can really relate to are the ones that they have a point. And, um, like, actually, I was watching this one uh, on Amazon called The Manor that really surprised me at the end. Spoiler alert. It's this old retirement home, and there's a coven of witches, and one this woman uh, discovers the coven of witches, and uh, she accidentally kills their leader, a warlock, but they explain to her, hey, you get on immortality. And uh, you're expecting her to like say, no, not at this cost, but no, she sides with them at the end, and she becomes the new leader mm -hmm. of the coven. And her uh, her uh, grandson, who's the only one that visited her, only one that believed in her, stuff like that, he gets a job there, and he's in on the coven and stuff like that, and helping them find their latest victims, and she gets immortality. She doesn't have pain anymore. And so it's like, again, I can relate to her. You know, it's that whole thing of, like, Spider-Man and, you know, you know one, 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 one more day. You know, it's just like I can't find anyone that doesn't have a loved one like Peter Parker did that was willing to sell his soul to the devil at whatever cost to just get one more day with that person. And so I can relate to that kind of stuff because it's real and it's believable, you know, and I don't have to necessarily agree with their choice from getting point A to point B, but I can understand their point. Good one. And I agree too. I, I, Marvel has done a good job of that, uh, you know, over the years and like, but yeah, I, like, like for instance, like, it depends on what storyline or Freddy Krueger you want to follow. I mean, right. if you want to follow that he's a fucking pedophile, or if you want to follow that he was um, some kids just didn't like him and they accused him of touching them. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm going with the I'm going with the old one where kids accused him of touching them and they lied on him and he was found not guilty and the parents did vigilante justice and killed him. I could see myself if that happened to me. I would be like, yeah, fuck your kids. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill generation and generation of your kids. Yes, I wouldn't do that, but I, but I understand how you would do that. You know what I mean? Like, 
So yes, I definitely yeah, I think it's agree. a relatability thing. It's and and at least I've learned from you know writing and and you know back in college and writing classes and stuff like that. You know the really good heroes and villains and your your characters they have to have elements that the reader can look at it and say I can I can see that I can relate to that because if they can't relate to it, then it's like you know I don't know you're watching a movie in Latin. You know no one understands yep. what anyone's saying. One percent. And a final question. What horror series are you tired of? What horror series am I tired of? That's kind of hard to say in terms of... What needs a break? Like, what, a break. Horror, what, what horror series... Like, I'm telling you, mine, <laughs> Halloween. Halloween needs a break. Right. I don't want to see another horror Halloween movie in the next couple of years. Yeah, um, most of those, I think, they need a break. Um, so it gives it time for someone to come along with a genuine new take on things. Okay, so I wasn't a big fan of the Rob Zombie remakes of Halloween, but I could appreciate what he was trying to do was trying to tell it from the point of view of, of Michael Myers. And so it's, yeah, it's so it, I guess I would have to say it's pretty much any kind of franchise because, you know, I... I understand it's a business and everyone wants to make money off of it. Keep, uh, keep people getting jobs, all this kind of good stuff. So I get that. But the thing of it is, is that that's not, that's not necessary because there's enough creative creativity out there and creative stories out there that you don't need to have 14 different movies and then reboot it all over again. Um, because you're trying to hope to retain some sort of intellectual property rights and hoping that the copyrights don't expire in the public realm all that kind of good stuff, you know, that you can just do new things, just new, just do new things, just do, do new things. So, uh, yeah, I can't name a, a specific franchise that I'm tired of because, you know, the minute it goes past like three, it's like, eh, I'm not going to watch any more than that. So it starts, long, it starts getting long and tooth. It does. And it's like, because, you know, and I get it. There's an audience that likes that, and they're the ones that are actually, uh, maybe even inadvertently, they're propelling it. As long as those things make money, then they're going to keep doing them. I get that. And uh, and I like to give them the benefit of the doubt because, again, maybe they're going to tell me something that's kind of different. Like the second Blair Witch, I love the second Blair Witch. I probably like that more really? than the first one. Oh, yeah, because it did something kind of different with it in terms of it actually took that concept that they were discovering this evil that they were trying to discover and made it into a villain into a piece a tangible villain whereas in the first one never really got to see it never really you know, we were just told what it was and we just got to see a bunch of kids scared with it and you know and it's that whole uh edgar Allan poe mentality of let the viewer's imagination create it for you and they'll make it scarier but i kind of dug some of the stuff in the second blair witch because it actually took that and then made it into an actual tangible villain that was going around possessing people and, you know, and watching their faces, you know, after they're like looking at security cams, it's like, but I don't, I, I don't remember doing that. It's like, that's fucking great. You know, that's the way possession works. You know, I step in for a minute and make you do some things. <laughs> I'm going to step out. And if I'm a really evil entity, I'm going to make you see what you didn't even realize that you did because I was in the driver's seat. And I'm sitting there saying, that's really kind of cool. It's different than doing another found footage film. And found footage horror, I can actually point to, is that I'm not a big fan of found footage horror because of that, you know, somewhere someone has got to drop the freaking camera. I'm yeah. running for my life, and why am I still holding the damn camera? <laughs> I say fuck his camera, yeah. Exactly. It's like I'm gonna be like throwing the freaking camera and then running. And it's like, so how did they find the time to keep holding the camera? <laughs> and so found footage horror is always hard for me to get into because you know of that. So that would be something else I would lump into of uh, do I need to see another found footage horror film? Yeah, I don't because I, I can never subscribe to them. And if people if that's their jam, I'm sorry. I don't mean to sh crap all over your, your jam. You know, you enjoy it. That's fantastic. I'm not the audience for that kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to tell you a found footage one that you have to watch. And there's three movies now, but there are three different kind of. It's called Mansfield. I can't. It's, if you go on Tubi, it's called Shit. I don't know. I'm telling you, man, I, I, ever since I hit 40, it's like <laughs> I, I get things. Uh, this one coming. It's called Mansfield Road or Mansfield Lane. But but you'll see once you type it in you'll see several of them, and it takes I've never seen it before but like the 
one of them it takes um like Alexa. Like everybody got fucking Alexas and the cameras and shit in the house. Mm-hmm. And that becomes possessed. So that's how you are seeing it found footage is through those fucking cameras. Okay, yeah. That that would make sense to me. You know, it's like uh Apollo 13, um, when I watched that one, and that's a found footage one, but it's all through the cameras within the, the, the capsule, the mm-hmm. Apollo capsule. And so it made sense to me that it's like, that's why I'm still seeing these things. Cause it's, you know, it's not the characters filming it. It's the machines around them and stuff like that filming it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's, those are things that it's like, okay, I can get behind that. And that's actually, you know, pretty decent to me because it makes sense. But like when I was watching Cloverfield, you know, the first time I was just like, man, how is he still holding on to the camera? <laughs> jump down into you know the subway levels and you and you and you took the time to pick the camera back up it's like really dude yeah. i would have through to... that motherfucker at some point i would have right. that motherfucker I'm at some point yeah. here and you're filming everything you're filming get the camera out of my face i'm trying to avoid boring the aliens to my presence so uh, <laughs> so yeah all right i got that logged in my phone i'm gonna go look that up yes definitely check that one out Groovy. all right Ted, where can everyone find you and your work? Um, I have my own website. So you go, I'm apparently the only Ted Wally, Ted with two Ds, uh, on the internet, on the planet. So uh, go to my website. I got links to everything. You can find it on Webtoons. You can find the book for free on Webtoons, actually. And all I ask for in response is that you give it that follow uh, and recommend it to people. You can find it on Tapas. You can uh, buy copies of my comic, physical comic. Uh, through my website, uh, as well as PDFs. You can get PDFs through Amazon.com. Um, but you go to my website, tedwally.com, and it gives you links to anywhere and everywhere to find my book. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I think I'm even on, you know, I don't know, Butterfly or whatever. So, you know, Again, by the time you land on the app, the kids are already moved on to the next one. I already want to this. Yeah, my students are telling me, oh, Mr. Wally, <laughs> you're on that? We're on this now. We're on Flippity Flop. I'm like, oh, Christ. Kids are just killing. So me. everybody has told me like X or Twitter, what the fuck's called, is like the thing now because yeah, like back Facebook is back being the thing now that the Elon Musk took it over, and like Facebook is not the thing. Facebook and Instagram are not the thing anymore. Like X is apparently the thing. Uh, uh, like, but but wasn't it like a couple months ago that Twitter wasn't the thing? And right. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah I, I had, uh, so I had so fucking confused. Yeah, I had students because uh, uh, I teach college. That's what pays my bills. And so I teach uh, illustration, animation, and graphic design at a uh, community college. And so invariably, you know, first day of class, you know, it's always the new students. That there's always one that before I'm even done with the lecture for the day, they've already searched my name. And they're like, oh, my God, Miss Wally. And, uh, and then I started getting the friend requests all over the place. And I can't ethically, I can't, you know, uh, they can they can follow me, but I can't follow them. Because it gets creepy and the state, yeah, of, just uh, state of Louisiana of all people uh, don't like that. So, uh, so yeah, you know, it's uh, and it's one of those things that uh, they, uh, invariably there will be ones who's like, "Mr. Waller, you're still on Instagram." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, I am not above picking you up and throwing you out this window, son. You Facebook know? is a ghost town. Facebook is a ghost town at this point. Like, no one's on fucking Facebook. <laughs> Oh, for old people. Yeah, like I'm on like Facebook me. because a lot of my buddies and everything, they're, we're still on Facebook, mm-hmm. and that's the only reason that we can keep track of one another. Is like, oh yeah. shit, you moved to New York? I didn't know that. Well, it's, it was all in my Facebook post, you know. Well, uh, so yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah, I'm on all the social medias as many of them I can think of, and if I'm not, you know, it's probably because it's just you know not a lot of engagement on there for me. So it's like I'm on X, and that was a discussion that we had. So it was like, oh no, everyone's back on X. And I was like, I thought everyone hated X. You know, yeah, I have to get an X. X. Yeah, that's why I fucked him. I have to get an X because because apparently for my channel, X is the best platform to get viewers and subscribers. And that's and I was like, and I didn't know that because I thought everybody ran away from Twitter once Elon Musk bought it. But no, people flocked to fucking Twitter like within the last couple of months. Apparently, right? Who, who knew? And a brother's got to do what a brother's got to do. So you know, that's where I got to be, then that's where I got to be. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to be uh, this, this, this supporting XN, Elon Musk. Soon. Exactly. Like, <laughs> he's an asshole. I don't like him, but you know, yeah. if that's where my audience is following me at, then I guess I'm going to have an account there. I don't know. Exactly. It's all about marketing, man. It's all about marketing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Listen, everyone, go down to the description. I have Ted's website um, down there. Please click on it. Follow, 
grab the comic book, do, do all that good shit. Ted's been a blast having you on, man. Likewise, I enjoyed this so much, Trav. This has been a blast, bro. Always, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And anyway, right, everybody, and follows and stuff like that. Thank you again. I truly, truly appreciate it. Most definitely. And everybody, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce, and that's Ted Wally. See you next time. Take care. <laughs>